This is very cutting edge. And in the next hour and eight minutes, I want to get drilled down into the problems, where we are at the moment, where we're going, and where the real challenges are, particularly uh, on regulation. The government of business, owner, regulator, and manager. Let me remind you, is this a shift in paradigm or merely a cyclical move of the needle? And it's changing virtually by the hour, by the minute, by the day. Um, in ways which all of you know, let's remember that the regulations are there. But what happened at the SEC? The SEC discovered Madoff, but didn't press home uh, its charges. As Madoff said, I was interviewed on Friday and thought I would be in jail on Monday. And they didn't ask the right questions. They didn't seem to have the right evidence. Regulation is there. Lord Adair Turner in Britain, head of the Financial <coughs> Services Authority, says the same thing. The regulations are there. But why are they not or were they not uh, being implemented? I want to highlight the learning process that's been going on, the pressure on personnel, where the personnel deficiency is in these regulatory uh, organizations and what has to be done there. How have treasuries and those responsible for regulation, whether the politicians or the civil servants or the officials, how, what have they learned from being on the inside when a crisis is growing and breaking Whereas I heard one very senior official in the US Treasury Department say, we walked into office, into the office uh, day after day, and found literally on a daily basis there was a new bank to save. Now, that's not what many people expect, particularly when you have a modestly sized department of barely six people uh, in the US Treasury. So we want to talk about regulation and also the price of regulation. I come from Europe. Only this week we've had. Uh, banks being saved by the British government last year. And then you have the European Union uh, Commissioner for Competition, Nelly Kroos, insisting that those banks are now so state-aided that they've essentially got to be broken up. In other words, the price of saving these banking institutions, certainly where I am at the moment, we're feeling that, we're seeing it with uncertainty when the British government owns 84% of one bank in order to save it a year ago. <coughs> We want to talk about the risk policies and the system and how uh, that is uh, under pressure. Um, is there actually a lesson for the banking system to learn? This, the other questions have been, have the banking system learned? But I want to know from you, with a show of hands, is there a lesson for the banking system to learn from what has been going on? That lesson still. Could you just show those of you who believe there is still a lesson to be learned in the banking community? Oh, wow. Wow. Is there anyone who wants to put up their hand and say no? <laughs> I'm tempted to ask you why, but I'll come back to you shortly. Um, and remember what we heard this morning uh, from Jaspal about the comparison to speeding. You keep speeding down that road and picking up speed until someone stops you or you get a fine. And the spirit that there is still that, uh, as we're seeing, the references to the casino, casino mentality, to what uh, Gordon Brown, the British Prime Minister, has called a market without morals. And so these kind of descriptions go on. And the pressure, particularly after we see what's happening with Goldman and the bonuses, but also what's happening elsewhere right across the system. That's the kind of framework uh, in which uh, we are going to hold this discussion. I want you to join the conversation. Uh, as much uh, as before, but I'd like to bring you in uh, much sooner. Someone who's actually been experiencing the pain, as he said, I'm a little bruised. He left uh, as Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank of India, uh, Rakesh Mohan. He left in June, a little bruised, but not quite for the same reasons that you might think, and he's going to explain why in a moment. We want to hear about the Indian policy. We want to hear about the Chinese policy as well with Fan Gang, director of the National Institute of Economic Research and chairman of the China Reform Foundation, but close to how this was responded to within the echelons of power in Beijing as the crisis developed, before even perhaps a lot of the Western governments were quite clear what was looming before those dreadful days in October last year, when, as we now know, the banking system was, quote, within hours of collapse. And finally, Ilian Mihoff. Uh, you've been introduced by uh, the dean here. So uh, I'll just add that uh, you're the professor of management and the environment. So those are uh, my guests and panelists who are going to try and unravel uh, where we go now with ownership, with regulation, and the role of business and government in this. 
Rakesh, let me come to you first, because India, in the end, has not had a recession. It's had a downturn. But you, as a regulator, and you as uh, Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank of India, faced an enormous cacophony, uh, certainly in the last two or three years, saying, you've got to unbundle, you've got to release our economy. Tell us about the bruising, and tell us what you've learned uh, now you're sitting in Stamford with a, uh, many, many thousands of kilometers between uh, Delhi and Mumbai and uh, the west coast of the United States. A lot of comforting uh, kilometers. Um, <laughs> um, but let me, let me first say that um, it's not just India, actually. One of the most fascinating things to me is, apart from India, what we did, I'll come back to in a second, is that in this particular crisis, which some people have called the mother of all financial crises, not a single Asian country or Latin American country even have their financial sectors in trouble. They've been all hit very badly in terms of the real economy, downturns in growth or actually negative growth, et cetera, but not a single Asian country or a Latin American country, financial sectors are in trouble. So I think that apart from ourselves in India, where we looked at financial regulation in some sense of a dynamic fashion, that we acted as it was necessary. We acted when we thought that housing finance was growing too fast. You never know in real time actually what is too fast and what is appropriate. You have to make judgments. We acted when we saw that the real estate financing was going too fast. We acted when banks were perhaps lending too much to non-bank companies. We acted when we thought that banks were perhaps lending too much to capital markets. In each case, there were some modulated actions in terms of increasing the risk weights, increasing provisioning, basically signaling. And you can now see post facto that actually those actions did have an effect. I do believe that this focus on financial regulation was not just us. Most Asian countries, most Latin American countries were doing something similar, of course, difference in degrees, differences in instruments. And I think it's because Asian countries learned from the Asian crisis, the Latin American countries learned their lessons from the multiple crises they've had in the last couple of decades. I think that is here, the, one of the, the main points that you, you, were, you were asking for, is there going to be a change in paradigm? Or it's just a cyclical thing, that perhaps it's time for the advanced economies that the United States uh, and European countries and the UK this time learn from the emerging market economies, see what the Asian countries and see what the Latin American countries, including India, have been doing in terms of a real-time dynamic attitude towards financial regulation, in addition to monetary policy. And this kind of silly separation between pure monetary policy of inflation targeting, where all you do is fiddle with one, instru with one instrument, that is the interest rate, anything, everything else will change. I think that is something, again, that most uh, Asian countries, most Latin American countries have not done, even though most of them do talk about flexible inflation targeting. I don't understand what flexible inflation targeting means. But that's what they may say, because the academics say you must do academics, you know, academics. They say that uh, you must do inflation. Uh, and they have, that you must do inflation targeting, otherwise you're not a real central bank, uh, or you're, you're stupid, you're not modern central bank. Uh, but Asians and Latins have actually not followed the academic, or they tell the academic, no, we're doing what you're saying. Can I, just, can I just ask you to highlight what the bruising process was for you, uh, given the enormous pressure on the Reserve Bank two to three years ago, just liberate the economy, liberate it, and you and the governor stood firm? Well, it, it was like this, that... Um, what had been happening right through from the early 1990s, actually, is that there had been a gradual, consistent process towards liberalization, both external in the sense that we had uh, uh, current account convertibility in 19 1994, uh, and we had consistent increase in the capital account convertibility, but we held fast on not opening the capital account fully. Similarly, on the exchange rate, we'd been liberalizing and making the exchange rate more and more flexible all through, but not making it a full float, so that we were intervening in the forex market all the time. Third, that in terms of financial instruments, we were increasing the usage of innovative financial instruments. And one proof of that is that the triennial survey that the BIS does, which was last done in 2007, actually showed that the growth of financial, the, both in the forex market as well as financial derivatives, was the growth rate in the previous three years was the highest in India bar none in the world. Of course, we started from a low base. 
Nonetheless, the criticism that came from a number of experts, a number of external experts, domestic experts, basically saying you're standing in the way of growth. Um, you are um, control freaks. You are into license raj, uh, et cetera. Uh, whereas what we felt is that look, if we are delivering low inflation, if we are delivering high credit growth of around 25% a year for about five years running, if you're delivering eight and a half to nine percent real growth in the economy over the period, we're clearly not stopping growth. But nonetheless, this was a consistent criticism. And um, it was unrelenting, actually, until the crisis. And the only thing I can say is that the one good uh, result of the crisis that we got saved. <laughs> Our reputations got saved. Are you a hero? Oh, I was, I'm very happy with the global financial crisis, actually. Are you, are you, <laughs> are you therefore considered a hero, rather, even if a bruised hero? No, I... the governor? No, one, one thing I would say is that if you uh, agree to join a central bank, one thing you must never think of is being a hero. Because you, if you think you're going to be a hero, then you're going to be a very bad decision maker. The job of central bankers is to act when it's necessary and be unpopular as necessary. Otherwise, heard, you should not be a central banker. And therefore, I will never think of myself as a hero. We did hear uh, Bernanke described as either mad or a genius this morning. Uh, so the role of central bankers in this is going to be very important. So let's just pause for one moment and let me move on to Fang Gang. Give us some insight as well, uh, uh, Fang Gang, uh, on how officialdom within Beijing has handled this. Because they are um, those responsible for being owner, regulator, and manager in um, a time of dynamic change and potential catastrophic change. How has Beijing responded? What is your perspective on how much they were able to see what was coming and preempt it? Because we have two very different systems, a very centrally controlled system, and in India, the largest democracy in the world. Well, I don't think they predicted that. Uh, but what they did was uh, they respond to the cycle much earlier than the global financial crisis. Because China, Chinese economy was in the cycle, in the booming and overheating uh, situation. And they took a lot of uh, actions, uh, try to calm down uh, those bubbles. I think that contribute to the, ability, to the uh, later ability to manage the economy and uh, manage the crisis. Uh, because in China, eventually, we didn't have got uh, very much bubble and including the uh, real estate and the financial uh, sectors. Uh, so then the financial institutions mainly in a very solvent situation, and the government fiscal ability is in the very good, and the inflation is un all under control. So I think that contribute uh, to their ability. Because this, I think this is, this is important. I think that for the management of the macroeconomic policy, for the central bank, for the, for, for the, uh, the treasurers, the microeconomic policy is not only for the crisis. You have to do something in the booming time to prevent the crisis, to prevent the bubble to, to take place. And then you have the uh, uh, better position. Coming back to your paradigm, I mean, this is our theme, paradigm shifting. I think- Or if, not. Or not. Uh, fundamentally, I would say, from the theory, from the uh, uh, history, there are two basic paradigm. One is, uh, as you said, state-owned and state-controlled and a state, and that's a planned economy. And I believe all the now people believe is uh, another paradigm, and actually that's a paradigm since the, since the Keynes. Uh, private ownership, market economy, but plus a regulation and a government monetary policy and those, those things. I think that's, that's actually since Keynes, and don't forget, Keynes is coming from from last the Great Depression, last the big, big crisis. And I think that the, this paradigm is not changed. I think, I believe China is moving to that paradigm too. Government ownership, yes, partially, uh, for the big financial institutions. But uh, don't forget, there is a non-government financial institutions, and the big ones already partially privatized. Say the big bank now 30% in the market or either in some kind of strategic ownership of foreign, of foreign banks. So things are moving to that direction without much change. And I don't believe that will change. I, I believe uh, 
90% of the economists and the politicians agree with this paradigm. But the only shift is the mood of the market and the psychology of the, of the people. After, say, 70 years without a big crisis, after 40 years without a big uh, 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 bubble, uh, inflation, particularly when we are in the new age of the dollar center, dollar standard monetary system, people start for, forgot, start to forget to, you know, forget what happened in the in the in the in the thirties, and become too bullish for this financial liberalization, financial freedom, and everything as long as you call it the market, and no one should be touched. So that, I think, is dangerous things. And that make all the regulations start to be unenforced. Actually, as you said, there's a lot of regulation there, but no one to enforce it. Let me no one to really com- to complete it. And that make the, the cycles, business cycles, and that make the, you know, people start to uh, uh, damage some regulations and forget we need uh, new regulations for new product of financial institutions, new derivatives, new uh, uh, hash funds, uh, behaviors. So the people forgot that. Then the problem. Many governments had to take extreme action at very short notice. How would you describe the level of perception to prevent and preempt within the Chinese system? Was there a nimbleness uh, within, among officials, I'm talking about the human side of this, in other words, the assessments that were being made and the speed at which they were being transmitted up through the system. We are, after, trying, after all, trying to find out whether a government should be owner, regulator, or manager. That needs human beings to make those decisions. What's your reflection on the nimbleness of the, the Chinese system on this? Yeah, well, the, uh, my, prospect, my perception of the, what the government think about is, number one, I don't think they now believe they will stay with this state-owned government, everything controlled. They Could believe I come back to the still, business of crisis management? management? In yeah. other words, that's what I'm trying to get to. The, the human side of those in government departments in Beijing working out what was about to happen and the speed at which it has to happen. Okay. Uh, number one, uh, they respond quite quickly uh, as individuals. All the news come, all, all the individuals are are watching and to learn what, what's, what's going on. And number two, the system itself, uh, I would say, can move very quickly uh, because the decision-making process actually in Beijing was quite short on this kind of matters. They don't need to go through the Congress. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they Keep going. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> they, 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 can, they can have a consultation with all part of the of government, different department, and a consultation with uh, academic people. They, they do seek for the advices. And they can make the, they, their mind very quickly. And their mind become, will translate to the uh, policies very quickly. So from that point of view, I would say, uh, there's some shortcut on the emergency uh, uh, issue. When, when emergency really take place, there is a shortcut. And for this microeconomic policies, I would say, I would say China is much more well prepared, much more well prepared for the earthquake than for the earthquake and for the other you know, uh, diseases, because before, there's no that system. Now they are building up the, that kind of system. But for the microeconomics, I would say, all these years, all these uh, uh, cycles, not big cycles, uh, we, don't, we didn't got the recession anyway in the past 30 years, uh, but there is a system which can work on that. So uh, the system are, are also ready uh, for this kind of emergency management. Right, let's go to the theory, Ilian, or the practice of the theory. <laughs> um, shift in paradigm or merely a cyclical move of the needle? What do you say as the uh, person who has to teach this um, in a place like uh, INSEAD about how much has really changed or not? Okay, as always, you know, when economists answer questions like this, it's some, somewhere in between. So it's both a shift in paradigm. Can I and pull you <laughs> off the fence. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think that will become a little bit clearer later on because I think <laughs> there will be permanent changes 
but I don't think that it's, uh, these changes are changes in paradigm in the way that capitalism, state ownership, and so on. Uh, before we go there, let's, uh, <clears throat> let me just uh, state that in my view, the role of the government is not only owner, manager, or regulator, but actually the biggest role of the government in any country around the world is to set the rules right for the businesses to operate. And I'm saying this, I want to emphasize this, because uh, yesterday in one of our sessions with business journalists, we're trying to figure out why in Niger income per capita is $1,000, in the United States $35,000, or was, you know, 15 years ago. And we decompose this difference into contribution of Nigerians don't have machines, or they don't have skills, or something else. If we ship American machines so that people work with them in Niger, they will produce not 1,000, they'll produce $1,500 worth of output. If we ship American workers with American machines working in Niger, they'll produce there not 35,000, they'll produce there something like 5,500. The big difference between income per capita in Niger and the United States is not because they don't have capital or labor. It's because the rules of the game, the environment is so bad that it acts like a huge tax, taking away from you $30,000 a year. And governments, especially governments in developing countries, basically ruin the possibility of the country to grow by not setting the rules right. So I think that this is number one. Number two, what we're discussing now, regulator, owner or manager, the second role of governments is when there is a market failure, for example, as we discussed in the case of uh, financial institutions, asymmetric information or externalities, then there is a need for regulation. That was also the, what the idea the uh, Fang Gang was saying. And I think that uh, there we don't have a necessarily a paradigm shift, but we have a lot of new things coming up in terms of the regulation that we have and what we need to regulate. And the third role of governments is obviously to manage the economy during cycles, see fiscal policy used in uh, recessions like this one. The way that I, I want to answer your question is that, in my view, the biggest change after this crisis will be that we'll start thinking about regulation, not from a static point of view, as Rakesh was saying, not just setting out the rules now, let's have 10% capital adequacy ratio, so whatever you know, ratio you have there, but to think about regulation from a dynamic point of view and even have something more, having a third policy pillar, which uh, Andrew Large, sir, Andrew Large called systemic risk policy. And systemic risk policy basically asks the following question. Can we avoid excesses in one direction or another direction by only using fiscal policy and monetary policy? by using the interest rate or by using taxes and uh, spending. And after this crisis, we would say no. After this crisis, we realize that actually bubbles, when they're excesses in one direction, interest rates are very poor tool to burst the bubble. So you need something else. And this something else is an entity, which could be the central bank or could be another entity that will monitor you know, key ratios or key developments, and like Rakesh was saying, well, if we see that the housing market is booming, then we'll tighten up credit. Or if we see that banks are doing something strange, we'll react there. So I think that what we learned from the Great Depression was fiscal policy is a useful tool, monetary policy is a useful tool. Monetary policy was lost in the 70s through the high inflation around the world, and it was reborn after the Great Inflation in the 1980s. After this recession, I think that, I hope, that we will see um, birth of systemic risk policy. What do you mean by that? By this I mean that instead of having an ad hoc decision making process where you say, well maybe I should increase interest rates, um, sorry, I should increase the ratio or the requirements for equity payments for houses by 10% or 15%, you start building a policy framework. What does it mean to regulate systemic risk when the, the whole system is under danger? So when we talk about regulation, and you mentioned something <coughs> before that we have so much regulation today and uh, you know, every, everybody is supervised, regulated, over-regulated, and so on. So far, regulation is basically deal, dealing from a micro perspective. You look at a bank, is everything right in the bank? Yes, no, and then if everything is right, you can go home. But nobody had looked from a macro perspective, if I connect all the dots, does it make sense? 
And what, if one of these dots blows up, what happens to the rest? Look at the communique from the G20 meeting in Pittsburgh. Look at the G20 meeting in London as well. Uh, let me broaden this out now. Do you believe that has created a new framework for additional regulation? Or is there a degree of real political opportunism to give the impression that something is changing? Is there a core drilling down into the system or not? I think that, uh, especially in the US, where I think that there, the need for changes is probably the, the highest. I think that the political will and the opportunities are just slipping away. I think that more and more it will be difficult to convince the Congress, and unfortunately I have to convince the Congress, <laughs> like China, <laughs> that you, know, you need some changes of this type. But and, substantively, uh, are, the, are the details there, do you believe, for that kind of systemic change? The details, I think the details are not worked out, but there is a will. So yeah. there is a will there de de declare that you know, they're going in that direction. But uh, the details we haven't seen yet. All yeah. right. Uh, China, India, I mean, what's the view on this about whether the regulatory framework is going to change significantly or just tinkering? Fan Gang. Yeah, I believe uh, in the American politics, there is a will, as you said. And we just have a hope. <laughs> we have hope that really can go on. But now we do see the backlash. We do see the Wall Street now is lobbying the Congress to stop that. This is not touchable, this is not that touchable. So uh, that's really a, a fear, I, I would say. That's dangerous. I believe there should be more regulation, as you, so, you, know, you, you point out. Additional additional, additional regulation for additional financial products. You have so many new financial products you know, in the 90s, in the 80s come up, then you need some regulations to deal with that kind of risk. That's, a, that's of course, that's a new product. That means there's new returns, but there is a new risk. When you have a new additional risk, you need the additional regulations to watch out. And you have to increase your, your transparency and let people know what the risk they are exposed to. So that's, I, I think we should have. And only from perspective of China, the only hope is to have more uh, reg regulation on the, not only on the financial side, but also the fiscal side on the, on the market economy. And then we can have the hope to have a more stable dollar. <laughs> and then we can have a more stable financial, inst financial system in the global. We're not gonna get diverted onto SDRs and everything else in this discussion. <laughs> no, no, no. We're, regulation, we're Rakesh, what do you believe? Do you think there's adequate regulation that's just got to be implemented much more um, decisively, or that there's a significant mood and a need for I, new regulations? I, I think that there's a clear need. Um, and uh, let me do full disclosure in the sense that I did have the opportunity or privilege of co-chairing the G20 working group on financial regulation, on which the later declarations from the G20 That's been based. why you're here. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I think, in, in fact, I, I would say that, that at the peak of the crisis, there was incredible consensus between within the G20 countries. Um, and if, if I may just mention that we did this report over a period of three months. We had only one meeting face to face. We did everything on conference calls of 20 countries at this, you know, in a conference call, I think about 10 conference calls. The reason I'm mentioning that is that at the peak of the crisis, it was very clear. There was consensus, there was intention, there was willingness, et cetera. But um, as actually I wrote in an article in June, uh, which has come out of the Bank of France Financial Stability Review, that I was, I was afraid that as soon as any degree of normality or perceived normality returns in financial markets, that willingness will go. And I think that the normality in financial markets has perhaps returned faster than people expected. So as was being mentioned, that the Wall Street lobbying, et cetera, is going on in full swing against this. So I am afraid that the willingness to carry out the kind of financial regulatory reforms is ebbing. So the politics is already skewing it's this just, intent. It's not just politics. I think, I think there's a little more to that. And I wanted, wanted to say is that a lot was what was behind the central bank's actions, the regulator's actions, is really the prevailing worldview academically of efficient markets. It was very difficult for regulators to act given that was the prevailing worldview of efficient markets. 
I don't see, I don't perceive a great deal of change in that academic thinking on financial markets until that happens. It's very difficult for politicians, for regulators, decision makers, to in some sense go against the grain of what is the prevalent thinking. And another thing that is very, very interesting to me is that uh, there are two books actually which I think everyone should read currently. One is a new one by Rogoff and Reinhardt called This Time is Different. And basically saying it's not different. And they have actually documented 800 years of financial crisis. Not 30 years, but 800 years of financial crisis. The precursor to their book, of course, was Kindleberger's book on mania's crashes and panics, or mania's panics and crashes. And that basically made the same argument. He's, the first edition of that was, I think, late 70s, the fourth edition now, I think. Uh, the difference is that Rogoff and Reinhardt have put numbers to all those crises. There's one thing in common, which we've known all through, we refuse to learn. And we got a great lesson on that this morning from Professor Hillian, and that is to do with leverage. Each and every crisis, financial crisis, has involved huge increase in leverage across the board. This was known to all concerned. It was not a secret. And yet, we did not act because I think there was this prevailing view of this time is different. Um, and so I think that's, to my mind, really the crucial issue uh, of, uh, of uh, the willingness to actually take all the actions to make the financial world safer. Let me just say one thing. You mean thing. by safer? Because there are, uh, there are many financial institutions and those working in them who say, lay off, we're creating, we're generating wealth. Lay off. Wealth we, are, we, wealth, are, wealth, we are creating wealth. safety for the economy. I think all you have to lead to is to read the Turner report and say whose wealth they were creating. Um, but I just want to mention in response to Fan, Professor Fan Gang on this issue of crises didn't happen since depression. Actually, the last 30 years have had the highest number of financial crises. A hundred countries, including developed countries, only the US didn't have one. That's so that's a, that's Sweden a I, had one. A yeah. hundred countries in 30, before the current crisis, now the count must have gone up to 120 actually, or 125. So actually, the last 30 years, you had the highest number of crises. And why is it the academic profession continues to call this efficient markets? Why, Ilian? <laughs> well, hang on. My, my, hey, let, let me get Ilian to answer this. Efficient <laughs> markets. We heard it as well this morning. Dagger after dagger in my bag. You know? <laughs> so uh, I think that uh, it's an oversimplification to say that the academics believe uniformly in efficient markets. I think that we recognize, and I would say that I, would say that I speak for all of us, and. Uh, that there are market failures, and sometimes the markets do not clear to the right price. Do your and models have market failure? Of course. The question is not sometimes 100 countries, sorry, 120 countries in 30 years. That's not sometimes. No, but, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, only, only US didn't have. And, uh, India by, and, and India, by the way. India and China. And China. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, let, let, me, let me finish. I, I ought let to me ask, finish. Is there any other country who wants to pay that <laughs> price? Let me finish. As long as the US didn't have the dominant theory and the doctrines are free market and the efficient market. And the so called Washington consensus will be still there. You have a crisis because you are not efficient. You have a crisis because you have too much regulation. So continue to liberalize. And why US didn't have this crisis? One reason actually was because US after the 71 US dollar become a standard money and they they would not never have a payment crisis because they just can print money to pay the pay the debt so that make them feel the perception of the risk become down and down and with so many years booming even great man Greenspan <laughs> forgot to to, to regulate. And, uh, so Chinese, that, and Chinese investment in that money, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> we help. <laughs> and uh, for developing country, we learned, we learned all this 100 country crisis, and we, uh, we, we try to be cautious, and we save too much. We learn land to an America. So that's a problem. That's become a... <laughs> 
I'd like your interventions here on regulation specifically. So can you get a microphone? Because I'd like your inputs specifically on, on the dilemmas of regulation. And while the microphone gets to you, and please, you know, three or four of you line up the microphones, this issue which has come, come to light in Britain particularly this week of banks which have been saved, quantitative easing which is going on, another 25 billion, less than the 50 billion that uh, the Bank of England was suggesting might be the case. The fact now we've got this serious problem with banks who are now being told by the European Commission that they're essentially state-owned and therefore they've got to fragment themselves. What about this as illustrative of the price of state intervention to save a system? Lian. Well, it's very easy to say, you know, that's, that's a price, that's a cost of doing all this, but at the same time, we should ask ourselves what would have happened if they didn't do it. So the cost, obviously, now of breaking down, going through all this uh, hassle, is very high. But at the same time, if at the time there was not this massive intervention, I can go on for an hour and a half talking about the Great Depression. So it's, uh, and I, I'm not going to do it. So. <laughs> but, <laughs> but this is, uh, I think that this is the right way to ask the question. If we have a choice to intervene or not, there will be cost, there will be price to pay, and it might be high price, but the alternative is much worse. Uh, can, can, can I tackle this with a slightly different uh, uh, viewpoint, which is that the issue of the role of the financial sector, actually, um, traditionally we've thought of the financial sector as a service industry, um, essentially engaged in financial intermediation to make the real economy grow and be efficient, etc. If you look at what happened in the last 10 years, as the weight of the financial sector went up, both in terms of uh, contribution to GDP or share of GDP, but even more importantly, and this is what uh, intrigues me, is the share in total profits in the corporate sector as a whole, particularly in the UK, the US, and Europe. What I'm, the question I'm asking is, and, and to my mind, this has sort of got sidetracked into the issue of compensation, because if it is the case that the sector is making high profits as it was, then either they have to be distributed to the shareholders or to the employees, and both was being done. The question is, has there been a lack of competition, which is, comes back to William's issue of uh, markets breaking down and therefore regulation, how can a sector make the kind of profits that were being made over the last 10 years if there was adequate competition? Why didn't competition whittle away those profits? Um, and so is there an issue in terms of lack of competition? This goes to the issue of too, too big to fail, the issue of competition, to my mind, as I said, we will attacking the issue of, comp competition from the, of compensation from the wrong end, you really have to ask the question, what is the role of the financial sector? Did, as the Turner Report questions, uh, what is the role of these derivatives? Do they have social utility? Are they serving the real economy or not? I think those are the key questions. Let's pick up on three or four interventions here at the back. Who else, who else has got the microphone? Several, please. I'd like to hear, can you be quite brief? I'm not going to answer them all uh, one by one, but just contributions on your perspectives on regulation. Regulations, I have a, um, an issue because, in full disclosure, former banker um, of s central banks, um, central banks are rewarding the behavior that you then talk about regulating. Asian central banks hold the largest number of uh, debt uh, outstanding for the United States. So how can we, on the one hand, talk about regulation when the behavior is being rewarded by Asian central banks buying um, U.S. treasuries? All right, just stack that up, can you? Please, here, and there are several microphones, please. Could you move it to somebody else? Yeah. Uh, as a banker from Malaysia, who have been regulated quite tightly, <laughs> I have always been very upset with the central bank for regulating us very tightly. And when the crisis hit, my first impression was, thank God they have been <laughs> regulating us so tightly. So you have a lot in common. <laughs> you have a lot in common with Rakesh. I do have, and I think Regulation, to a large extent, is intended with good objectives, and we should not underestimate the role of regulation. So I totally agree with the, with the Chinese and the Indian way of controlling the, the central bank and the monetary policies. And I think in the long run, that's the best way to go about it. Because Can you define a halfway house somewhere? <clears throat> Possibly, you know, we, as we all feel very frustrated as bankers when, whenever we go to the central bank with new products, why they take so long to approve it. But on hindsight, 
Some of these uh, uh, derivative products were attempted in Malaysia, but the Central Bank of Malaysia refused to allow them to be marketed, and that saved our system from the, this risk. And quickly, what kind of percentage would be rejected under that level of regulation? Can you put a number on it? Well, half, quarter, it's, two no, thirds? Maybe not half or quarter. Prob the rejections are, are minimal, but when it comes to two complicated products, they will definitely go through and try to understand, and they won't just approve it without clear understanding. All right, keep the microphone moving around, please. Yes. Um, I'm not a financial expert, but in my view, the, the, the roots of this crisis were were started with the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act in the late 90s. And when you were able to combine retail banking with, um, with the investment banking and so on, and having a, been able to use cheap deposits and money from the government to invest in risky assets. And there was a problem of moral hazard where the, um, the, the people running the banks were extracting a lot of rents for themselves using this cheap money. Can I press you on the issue of regulation and what yes. do you think about well, that? Well, I think, I, I just said it, I, I think we should go back to the uh, uh, Glass-Steagall Act and separate, like Mervyn King and other people have suggested, retail banking from investment banking. They can take all the risks they want, and then if they fail, they fail on their equity, but not on our deposits. Let's pause at that point. A couple of very important points, Ilian, on that. Uh, so actually, when, when I talk about the crisis, I do talk about the Glass-Steagall Act. To me, the repeal per se is not the big issue. The big issue is that you repeal the Glass-Steagall Act and you create an entity on which one side, one room is heavily supervised and regulated, and there is another room that is completely in the dark, the investment side. So you start shifting things that are regulated, things that uh, are subject to capital adequacy ratios from the commercial bank to the other part. In other words, what is important is to have consistent regulation, not more, not less, consistent regulation across entities. For example, Germany has universal banking, but Deutsche Bank is regulated as one entity rather than investment arm versus commercial. Rakesh, was that the spirit of your working group? Um, no, we would, didn't really deal with the issue of glass tickle, but I would make a comment. The spirit I'm talking about. Uh, not the principle of right across. The uh, no, principle of right across, yes, certainly. That uh, mm -hmm. the working group did say that you have to have regulation across the board and not particular institutions. Um, but one, one comment I want to make on the glass tickle is that remember, the, the institutions that got in real trouble, that is, Bear Stearns, Lehman, were not universal banks. They were essentially investment banks. So. In that sense, a little difficult to, 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 to ascribe the problem to Glass-Steagall. May I question, may, 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 yeah. may I address the question yeah. that from there? Um, you know, what we poor nations do when the US monetary policy insists on the highest volatility in the world, uh, which is to say that uh, the, the response of the US monetary authorities from their own point of view, I can't fault them in the sense of whether they were not, whether, whether they were not doing the right thing for their own country in a sense. That after the dot-com crash, they went down to 1%. So obviously money flooded to us, and same thing is happening now. We don't seem to have learned the lesson of that exactly the same thing is happen happening now in terms of very large capital flows because of the very, very low and extended, and the announcement of extended low interest rates. In fact, we've looked at this for the past 30 years, and you can actually look at the financial, global, the, the financial crisis taking place in EMEs un until the recent global crisis, have all, just about most of them have been preceded by first the US monetary policy loose, loosening, Europe follows because they're very connected to the US, and so there's uh, the search for yields and capital flows to emerge, emerging market economies. So we have no choice but to do what we've all done, uh, which is to intervene in the markets and protect ourselves. And this cycle has been going in amplitude actually right from the 1980s. You first had the Latin crisis, then you had the Asian crisis, and now of course the own crisis. I notice you say poor nation. You've just bought 200 tons of gold. <laughs> well, you know, uh, for I, one suppose, I suppose, if, capita. Capita. I suppose, I suppose, I suppose, I suppose if you believe that $1,000 yeah. per capita is rich, then yeah. you're very rich. But uh, what, your, your, the reality of India at the moment is changing very significantly and very oh, fast. Oh, absolutely. No, no. Of course we are growing fast and all that. But I think that, you know, even if we grow at 7% per capita per year, um, 10 years from now, it will only be $2,000 per capita. Right, dollars for 20 years from now, it will be $4,000 per capita. Okay. One, less than one-tenth the US today. Picking up on this issue of regulation. Yeah, well, uh, several things. Uh, I think the uh, classical abolished after that, uh, the, the problem is not only the universal or not. They abolished because 
maybe because of the, that we need a universal uh, the supervi uh, supervision, but the problem is that afterward, all aspect, the regulation had been weakened. So this, people just forgot, people just didn't enforce what, what they should enforce. I think that's a problem, that's a, create the, the crisis, not because the universal or not universal. And then back to the question of this uh, cost for the, for the regulation, for the, owner, uh, for the ownership. I think uh, as a Chinese economist that we understand that cost very well. <laughs> when you have this ownership, uh, of course, the moral hazard things. And uh, even in the crisis, for the crisis, that's also very costly. And uh, reward, reward the bad guys, uh, that will create the moral hazard in the future. Uh, but I think the, everything is a, a comparison, in economics, comparison of the different cost and the opportunity cost. If you don't do that now, the cost is even high. For China, uh, I think uh, we need to prepare the cost uh, if we do this. Uh, we still keep some state ownership now. Uh, but if you don't, the quick privatization, overnight privatization, that cost may be even higher. Uh, like the, what the Russia happened in the Russia. So that's a, that's a comparison. But I believe in most of uh, uh, this, uh, uh, I mean, developed countries, this is a temporary. This is ownership. I don't believe uh, people will keep that for a long time. Of course, I, I, have, I heard of a story, 27 years, uh, some uh, public, I mean, nationalization of the, some bank in Minnesota it is still in the, uh, in the public hands. Uh, so that would may, may take a long time, but uh, definitely I, I don't think that will cost very much. Only thing is the moral hazard we need to uh, realize, and that's why the regulation change is important. Otherwise, people enjoy this, and then tomorrow they forget. I, I would submit that part of the problem at least, and particularly in the U.S., is not necessarily the regulatory system, but actually who is employed by the regulators. I think if you look at the SEC, it's primarily lawyers, largely junior lawyers, and they're primarily focused on compliance, box ticking, is the form filed, et cetera. You look at the Madoff case, which hasn't come fully to light yet, but you also look at Lehman, Bear Stearns, regulators were there on virtually a monthly basis. They weren't focused on what was being done, what the balance sheet looked like, what the leverage ratios were. They were only focused on where the forms filed. That's my hypothesis. But I think if the regulators were, particularly in the US, as I said, had more forensic accountants and fewer lawyers, we might solve problems quicker. Let me press you on that. Do you think- well, I have a question. How, how come the regulator didn't get alerted? If you have someone who has a name called Madoff, wouldn't he make, it up, make off with the people's money? They, they, were, they were alerted. They were alerted. Times. They didn't do anything. <laughs> They sent junior lawyers to make sure that the forms were filed, and they were looking for front running as opposed to checking whether trades were actually made. Which okay. comes back to that issue of capacity and capability of those within the regulatory framework. But, 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 uh, but that means the regulatory framework didn't require the people check on the leverage, or leverage never be a problem. So I think that's the problem of the framework itself. It's not the problem of the people themselves. Well, Do you agree, I think if the, if the rules have to be that specific for people to find something like Madoff, um, we're, we're not giving the regulators any credit in terms of their own talent. I think what's, that's your, a big what's your reflection, Rakesh, given that you have had a successful regulatory system within India when it comes to the capacity and capability of those who are appointed? I don't know enough about the um, staffing of the SEC or the U.S. But in your country? Regulators. I mean, our country, basically, you have what you might call generalists who then serve within the Reserve Bank on the securities regulator for most of the rest of their lives. So they have long accumulated experience. The other thing that I would say, and this I'm sort of speaking personally in the sense of the experience that we had, is that from both the regulatory side of the Reserve Bank and the monetary side, we learn from each other by being in the same house. So for example, as I was a monetary authority, not the regulator, my colleague, deputy governor, was the regulator and supervisor. Um, we had something called the Board for Financial Supervision, which meant every month, which meant every month and all of us members of that. So that as a monetary authority, I was constantly informed by what was happening in a banking system, in the non-bank companies, et cetera, on a monthly basis. 
Um, whereas a lot of this separation that has taken place, and of course in the US you have multiplicity of authorities doing banking regulation, et cetera. Um, whereas in so many other countries, the FSA in the UK, and the same thing has happened in China, that a lot of the information is lost on both sides. So the regulator, as uh, Frank Brown is saying, the regulator, the regulatory staff, is then not looking at those leverage ratios, et cetera. Which to my mind, they would, if they were more combined and there was that, that constant interplay taking place, understand different legacies of regulatory systems, so that I'm not saying everyone should become the same, but there can be much better methods of regular information exchange as opposed to just looking at the screens and looking at that information. Do you believe that uh, within the regulatory system there can be sufficient smart analysts, auditors, in the way that Frank has just described, who can take on the smart yes. boys of Wall Street well, and London yeah, th and Frankfurt and elsewhere? I think that's a very good point because I do believe personally that that issue of smarts is overstated. I can certainly say that, look, uh, all of us say in the Reserve Bank of India would not ever, would, cannot claim to be any smarter than any other regulator or people in the private sector. I think it was just that the experience, what you gain by looking at the system as a whole, that you act. So I think that this issue of, uh, you know, that you, that you must have rocket scientists. If you had rocket scientists, they will even do much worse, actually. Thank, thank you. I, I don't think the economic theory doesn't assume the government people is smarter than the private sector, exactly. or vice versa. Exactly. They only assume different functions of different institutions. So your private sector will just compete. And, but the, uh, you have to assign the government institutions you know, a certain mandate. But if the mandate isn't wrong or is not efficient Most enough, too. that's the problem. Yeah. And I think they are equally, yes. equally full or equally smart. So that's, a, that's the thing. Right. I'm Christoph, I'm a German banker working here in Asia. My theory is no regulator can compensate for total loss of common sense. <laughs> and what do I mean? We completely lost common sense when it comes to risk return ratios. No one talks about rating agencies here. If securitized chunk would have not carried triple A's or double A's, the bubble, the financial crisis would not have happened. As simple as that. And it's also, it's all of us. I mean, banks is also, or banking financial industries offer and demand. Each of us being a financial investor on whatever number levels. We all expected over the past five to 10 years, risk, uh, re uh, returns of return on equities of 20, 25% and thought this comes risk free. While in the real economy, I mean, a normal return on equity in the real economy, economy is something of, let's say, 10%. And a risk-free return on equity is something like 2 3%. What is your definition of common sense in this? Because there are those out there who are in the hedge funds and elsewhere who like the business of risk and gambling away from traditional banking. And there are others as well, we heard this morning, the shareholders who expect the big returns. But with all my respect, hedge funds, private equity funds, who's working there? These are, extre are extremely smart youngsters, which are used to extremely smart mathematical models. And they are, and what we heard this morning, they believe everything can be modeled. But the experience, and this is to me common sense, I learned banking 30 years ago, that we talked in Germany about a so-called golden bank rule. Those rules, common sense, I mean, they did, haven't been applied over the last 10 years. Can you outmodel? the smart hedge fund operators, do you think, Ilian? Uh, no, I think that it's always uh, a chase. You know, it's, uh, you, you think about, you know, the current situation. Why did all these banks started shifting the mortgage-backed securities of their balance sheet? Because of regulation, because of the capital adequacy ratio. Yeah. And therefore, you have to be continuously monitoring this chase. Otherwise, I don't believe, I wish, it, I was wrong, but I don't believe that we're capable of changing human nature. You know, I lived in a country in Bulgaria where they tried to change human nature, <laughs> it didn't work. So it's, and the it's going to be there. And the corruption continues. And the corruption is getting worse now. <laughs> Even with the EU, Fan Gang. Nick, 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 could, could, could I reverse the question to you? What is, your to yes. what is your definition of smart? These guys are obviously not smart, they lost a lot of money. <laughs> Some of them are making a lot more. <laughs> Fan Gang. No, uh, it, you are suggesting uh, the reading thing, reading business should be back to the public hands to be, become a government. 
That will be uh, some improvement. At least there must be a much stricter segregation of Segregation, some kind of a monitoring, some regulations on that rating business. I think that's a, that's a very important issue, you know, uh, uh, how to make a judgment. That, that's a smart or not. If you really make effort, you know, for the regulatory uh, bodies, if you really make effort to check those financial risks or, or security or safety. So Let me hear some more. First, I don't believe that the Glass-Steagall Act changes anything. The European banks had no Glass-Steagall Act. Yes. And in fact, there, was not, there were not many accidents in Europe during the last crisis. So that's not a problem. But along with what Frank said about uh, the United States and the regulation by the SEC young lawyers, I think one of the reasons why in France there was no big accident, there was one accident in one bank through a trader, but it was uh, fair, easily solved, is that the people in charge of regulation are seasoned people. I mean, I've been through a lot of banking controls as a banker, and the people who come are not young lawyers. They're, they're people in their 40s, 50s, who have 20 years of experience, know what to look at and do look at. And, and since the bankers know that they will look at it, they don't do what they shouldn't do. It's really a question try. of implementation of controls. More, and I don't think we have more regulations than the others, yes. just we apply them. Yes. You don't need to have excessively smart people among them. They need to be experienced and willing to act in terms of what they see. And the regulators need to know that they will do that. Um, another, this question of this, uh, this uh, capital flow, I think, is a very important one, that when you do have very loose monetary policy, you do have this issue of capital flow. And this is a general issue, as I said, that has been uh, disturbing countries for not just 30 years, but even earlier. Again, you look at the various uh, crises of uh, manias, et cetera. So I think that's a very important issue. You'll, you'll remember that when after the first, when the crisis first started, and the US Federal Reserve brought down its interest rate very sharply at late 2007, the oil price shot up. And that's when you had a huge oil price increase, $150. And then, of course, it came down much later. Something similar is happening today, where asset markets are again going up, uh, stock markets are going up, property markets are going up in some of our countries, um, and, of course, oil prices are going up. So I think that we do need to be looking at the monetary policy issues that then cause the, some of these asset prices going up and the, the monetary policy authorities still focusing only on the CPI is a problem and not looking at asset prices. I'll stop there. I'm going to close this with a show of hands, please, because we've been talking about uh, whether this is a shift in paradigm or a cyclical move of the needle. Who of you out there think uh, that there is a shift in paradigm uh, on the issue of uh, the government owner, regulator, and manager? One hand going up, two hands going up. Who thinks this is just a cyclical move of the needle? <laughs> Totally unscientific, but interesting. <laughs> Can I thank you all very much indeed? Thank and uh, hand on to the next